Hello guys and gals, and this is part 25 of our reading of Twilight Zone, or actually Rod Serling's Twilight Zone, 26 Unforgettable Explorations into the Realm of the Supernatural, and it is adapted by Walter B. Gibson. And we're going to, of course, go over the copyright information, which should be on the screen now. Let's see, here it is. Rod Serling's Twilight Zone is copyright 1963 by Cayuga Productions Incorporated, and Rod Serling's Twilight Zone Revisited is copyright 1964 by Cayuga Productions Incorporated, all rights reserved. This 1983 copy, this 1983 edition, sorry, is published by Bonanza Books, distributed by Outlet Book Company, and it is a Random House Company, and then that gives the address. The, uh, this book was previously published as two separate works entitled Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone and Rod Serling's Twilight Zone Revisited. Uh, it was printed and bound in the United States of America, and it gives the Library of Congress information. Now, in the last part, we started reading The Riddle of the Crypt, but we didn't get very far in. We met Irene and Roy, and that was about it. And they're on some kind of island, so let's find out. Um, the taxi said J. Cuppy, and it says taxi, okay. The settlement about the pier was a combination of fishing and tourist haven, with a post office, some stores, seafood restaurants, and fishing shacks. But the slopes that funneled up from the harbor were studded with cottages of early 20th century vintage. They, they were reached by zigzag roadways and paths with rock-hewn steps that served as shortcuts. Then... Roy drew Irene back to the outer end of the pier and pointed to a ledge set back far be, uh, back beyond the very top of the slope. Oh, that on that dominant height, Irene could make out the uh, oh on that high dominant point, Irene could make out the front of a brand new ranch house, ruddy in the sunlight's glow. There, I that. I will have you know, said Roy, is our humble abode to most modern habitation on all Cliff Island with the best outlook. Irene's round, enthusiastic face beamed an appreciative smile. She was starting to say that the place looked wonderful even from a distance when Mr. Cuppy put the last bag in the taxi. So they, t they hurried to the ancient car and climbed in while Cuppy took the wheel and asked, Where to, Miss, Mr. Morrow? To Castle Rock, um, returned Roy. We're living in the new ranch house there. Mr. Cuppy sat as if frozen behind the wheel. Then he slowly turned his thin red neck and gave the two passengers a long beady look, turkey fashion. Next, he made a move as if to get out and remove the bags. Then, without a word, he looked ahead again, wheezed the old motor into action, and headed the car up the hill. The view was increasingly beautiful. All the way up the long zigzag road, Middle Harbor was an ever-changing scene, with occasional glimpses of the ocean through the rocky walls of the channel. Then, at, at the top of the island, became because... Then, at the top, the island became a saucer-shaped plateau that Irene could see, and, oh, and Irene could see the ocean all around with an island-studded bay toward the west. There, the sun going down beyond the mainland blended crimson gold and purple in one magnificent splash. The taxi gained new life down the slight winding slope. It paused... Now it passed a stretch of barren, rocky ground, veered away from a thick clump of pine trees, and groaned up a slight, curving quarter-mile grade that brought it in back of the ranch house, instead of using the driveway. Mr. Cuppy stopped on the road, unloaded the bags while its passengers alighted, and said, That'll be one dollar, as Roy handed Cap Cuppy a bill the taxi man client. Uh, clambered back into the car, saying, Gotta get down to the old dock real quick. The Countess is coming in. With that, he swung the car about and rattled away as Irene asked, And who is the Countess? A boat, replied Roy. 
the steamer from the mainland, but she isn't due until 9 o'clock tonight. <laughs> I can't understand what's wrong with Cuppy. I can, came a, cheery, came a cheery voice behind them. Irene turned and saw a smiling young man with a shock of light hair. I've been watching from over from our ivory tower, expecting to see this happen. This is Adam Blount, introduced Roy, who is helping me in my study of marine fossils. Go on, Alan. Why wouldn't Cuppy carry the bags? Because no person living on Cliff Island will set foot on the blighted ground surrounding Castle Rock. That road is the dividing line. You'll see people walk by on the far side looking at us as if we were saying skinny on your skinny on your own side this side is taboo a crazy superstition that's all irene irene smiled recalling many places that she had been where old customs and strange superstitions were common but they had never but they had never worried her besides she didn't want to be bothered by visions on cliff island she was here on assignment for her company, International Metallurgics Association. She had traveled through South America for IMA, and they had given her the job of translating and condensing all subsidiary reports from Spanish and Portuguese into English. A two-month job at least. Roy, a professor of biology at a state university, had had heard of the wonderful ranch house on Cliff Island and had rented it while making his fossil survey. So Irene had decided to come and do her work there. She liked the place as they entered the back door through a modern kitchen where Roy gestured to two bedrooms on the right side and said, Those are bachelor's quarters for Alan and myself. You have the left wing, sis. It was planned as a garage, but nobody keeps a car on Cliff Island or the taxi business would die. So they turned it into a studio with a glass window in place of a front door. Come and see it. It instantly became Irene's dream room. From the picture window, she could see the whole harbor with the limitless ocean beyond, while a casement window at the side gave a view of the pine woods and the stretch of rocks beyond the curving road. Each morning, Roy and Alan left early, and Irene went to work on her translations, pausing at intervals to look from the front window at a scene as varied as it was beautiful. For the woods, oh, for the moods of the clouds and ocean were many. But at times, Irene found herself drifting into a dreamy state in which the present faded and everything seemed as distant as the boundless sea. Oh, anyways, she was... Jolting from, jolted from her reveries by a sensation of watching eyes and a figure creeping behind her. Then Irene would snap from the clutches of the unknown, often with a, an involuntary scream. All about, she would see floating blobs of blackness that would gradually dissolve. After such shocks, Irene felt an urge for human company. The fact that the islanders regarded this ledge as taboo struck her with numbing force. Irene would rush out to the back road. There she felt safe, though no one was ever around. Sometimes Irene regained her calm by walking down the road to the pine woods, which, which, was, beautiful, which was beautifully shaped and exquisitely green compared to the otherwise drab landscape of the plateau. In bright sunlight, the evergreens were restful. On cloudy days or under the colorful tints of early sun, sunset, the grove took on a deep, deeper green that absorbed Irene's worries with it. With it. The rocks beyond the, the grove were typical of the island's ruggedness. A hundred feet to the right of the, ever, the evergreens, several hundred heavy stones were tumbled in a pile, at least 30 feet across and half that high. The, <laughs> the pile interested Irene because it was man-made. She passed it late in the afternoons when she cut across to a path that led down among the cottages to the harbor. Then she met Roy and Alan when they came in on the river. Oh, on the rover, sorry, the boat. 
Often, she stopped at an employment office to try to hire a woman to help with the housework. But when she said Castle Rock, none were ever available. Sometimes Irene had a fish or lobster dinner with Roy and Alan at one of the seafood places. Other times she prepared dinner at the ranch house. Almost always they went up the hill in Cuppy's taxi. Until one afternoon when the whole ocean became a mass of yellow billows formed by a low clinging fog that kept creeping up, in, up the island's craggy walls. By the time Irene reached the dock, she could just make out the bulk of a Coast Guard craft that was moored there. From its loudspeaker call from its from, from it, sorry, a loudspeaker called off names, giving information about boats that were overdue. One announcement came. Miss Morrow, Miss Irene Morrow, message from Rover, fog bound at Port Clarion, will return to Middle Harbor tomorrow. Irene ate alone at a pier restaurant and stayed late, hoping that the fog would clear, but it lessened only slightly. She found Cuppy asleep in his cab, waking him, oh, wakened him, and they started up the hill. When, Cup, when Cuppy, working his way slowly in low gear, Irene decided that this was a good time to get first-hand evidence on the Castle Rock taboo. I won't ask if you... Oh, I won't ask you to drive me to my door, she said, but I would like to know why nobody on Cliff Island will come to Castle Rock. Well, the rock has a curse on it, replied Cap Cuppy, some sort of spell that has never worn off from long ago. People have seen strange critters up toward the rock, the kind that change into the, the kind that change to giant bats. You mean vampires? retorted Irene. They are they're bunk. I have seen vampire bats in South America, but they prey on cattle, that's all. Just then a huge swooping shape came into the glare of, of the car's bright headlights. Its wings were like mammoth arms as it loomed from the fog. Irene's nerves from the fog. Irene's nerves, which had been getting worse daily, were so raw that she started to scream, but rather than show weakness, she reduced it to eek, to an eek, an answering eek came from the, f the flitting shape, which was gone instantly, leaving only a whitish swirl of, of, of the fog. Irene decided it was an ordinary bat magnified by the fog to gigantic proportion. As they neared Castle Rock, Cuppy suggested, Look, Miss Morrow, I'll back my car so the lights will guide you into the house, so nothing can come at you in the dark. You mean, va you mean a vampire, broke in Irene, like the one we just saw? I'm not sure what we did see, returned Cuppy. The worst thing is the yellow eyes that people see up here. They come from the pine woods. He gestured to the ominous bulk of blackness to, on the right. But look ye, lady, if you get in the house and keep all the windows tight shut, nothing can sneak in with you. Not even none of that fog. That's all I'm that's all I've got to say. Cuppy uses bright lights as a path to the house and Irene followed it. Once she was inside, Cuppy cut his headlights to dim, probably finding they reflected less glare from the fog. He started back down the road and Irene went into her studio garage where she looked toward oh, where she looked toward the pine grove wondering if she would see those yellow eyes. Then suddenly she did. Tiny yellow beads that squinted from the swirl of the fog and hovered as though coming closer. Irene wondered if Cuppy saw them from his creeping car. Then just as her nerves reached the shrieking the shrieking point, Irene gave a laugh and was hysterically was hysterical but glad. The yellow the yellow eyes were the tail lights of Cuppy's car. Their red lenses had gone to pieces years ago, leaving only little bright bulbs like yellow beady eyes. Irene realized that when Cuppy swung past the grove, because this was the first time his dim lights were showed and the tail lights veered at the, at a new angle. Irene wished that this harrowing sight was over. Instead, it had just begun. When she opened the front door for air, fog billowed, billowed in. With it, oh, when it vanished, 
After she slammed the door, it seemed all the more like a living thing. There was a magnetic force here that created living phantasms. For when Irene looked from the window, she could see fog faces f form there and dissipate in ghoulish swirls. She ran about clamping windows and bolting doors until, overwhelmed by mental and physical exhaustion, she cla collapsed in a big chair in the living room. All the lights were on, but she was still fearful until she fell into a sleep so deep that when she finally roused from it, she started up trembling. All the lights were still on, but their glare was lost in the dazzle of broad daylight. There was no longer fog faces peering at Irene, but real faces, those of her brother Roy and his assistant, Alan Blount. It was morning, the fog had lifted, and they had come back in the in the quote unquote ranger when irene told them what had happened they nodded their own work was so so exactly oh. their own work was so exacting so limited on board the rover that irene their irene's talk of dazing moods and the floating blackness struck them as the result of her daytime intensity and isolation one night alone had touched off Irene's accumulation of nervous tension. Roy and Alan stayed home that day. At night, they strolled beneath the stars with Irene and pointed out the constellations, which made earthly worries seem small. The next day, Roy had another idea. He told Irene. We've been talking this over, Alan and I, and we want you to come with us to Port Clarion. And while you're staying, well, while you're studying starfish instead of stars, you can go to the library and dig up the history of Cliff Island. There may be something behind this nonsense about Castle Rock, so let's get to the bottom of it. Port Clarion was much like Middle Harbor, but on a larger scale. There Irene saw the tubby Countess, a little steamer with its two decks sprouting, uh, sprouting tourists. As she came in from her more morning tour of the islands of Fisherman's Bay, which included Cliff Island as the outermost. At the library, Irene said that she was visiting Cliff Island, carefully avoiding any mention of which part, and that she was intensely interested in its history. When she joined Roy and Alan for dinner at one of the big pier restaurants, Irene was well briefed on her subject, but she waited until the rover was speeding through the moonlit bay back to Cliff Island with Jerry Lane at the helm. Then she sat in the, cop the cockpit with Roy and Alan while she went into the story. Apparently, Cliff Island was settled by the French in the early 1600s, uh, stated Irene, and they kept it clear up to the, the year 1715. That's not surprising, put in Roy. The French had many outposts that they managed to keep from the British. In this case, they really, in this case, they really held them off, Irene informed them. The cliffs were like a fortress. The French peasants raised crops and cattle on the plateau, but occasionally their fishing was curtailed when the British occupied Middle Harbor. So about the year 1700, a French sea rover was appointed to take charge. He was called the he was called the Commandant La Sang, and he sailed into Middle Harbor on a ship called the Adventure. The first thing that La Sang and his crew did was build a citadel on the high r rim of the plateau, right where we are living now. That is why it is called Castle Rock. He used to light beacons on a high point called Cap Bec. No, sorry, Cap Bec or Cape Beak, but which is now known as Signal Head. I know Signal Head, said Roy. We'll show it to you when we get there, but go on with the story, sis. The arrival of the adventure caused great joy, continued Irene, but all changed to gloom when Le Sang ruled the island like a tyrant. He and his evil crew committed murder, tortured helpless prisoners, and brought terror to the island. Finally, the British attacked, bombarded his citadel, and took over the island. The inhabitants were shipped away, and it was years before the island was settled again. And what happened to Captain Lesang? 
asked Roy. He dis he disappeared, replied Irene. Some say he escaped in a boat from one of the other harbors. Other accounts say that he was killed during the attack on the castle. It is even claimed that he was killed earlier, but that his ghost returned and was still in command when the castle was demolished. That could be the groundwork for the vampire talk, agreed Roy. Did you run across any of that stuff in the old archives? Um, yes, weird yellow eyes that have been seen gleaming through the fog. People have been attacked by a gruesome monster that slashes their throats. Some persons have disappeared like Lesang himself. Disappeared completely without a trace? In some instances, yes, but bodies have been found floating far out to sea, and others have been discovered in the deep pit over which the old castle was built, which is now our cellar. Uh commented Roy grimly. No wonder the place gives you the shakes. I can't blame people for not wanting to come near it. I'm sure I can stick it out. Irene, Irene's tone was determined. I should have laughed it all off when the yellow eyes turned out to be nothing but a taxi's taillights. However, keep a good grip on yourself when I tell you that the most fearful legend of the lot, when the full of the moon arrives, the adventure is sometimes seen sailing into Middle Harbor. Then things really cut loose. Okay. You mean those things that you just mentioned? And more. Once the ghost ship has been sighted, the Sang's own ghost is sure to appear. That's one legend that just won't die. It's a funny thing, put in Alan. We've talked a lot of we've talked with a lot of characters around Middle Harbor, but there's never but they've never handed us any of this because that's the last place where they ever will talk about it, rejoined Irene. The librarian, Miss Lucy, says that the islanders are so afraid of its hurting the tourist trade that they even suppress all picture postcards dealing with it. Those used to be popular some twenty years ago and Miss Lacey told me of a shop that was still bootlegging them, so I bought some. Triumphantly, Irene produced a batch of picture postcards, which Roy and Alan studied eagerly in the light of the cockpit. One card showed Castle Rock in its barren state, another with an artist's conception of Lasang's citadel towering upon it. One card showed the pine woods, which was appropriately termed the haunted grove, while another had the stone pile labeled Old Norse ruins. Another card depicted Signal Head with its ancient beacon in full flare. And there was some close-ups of a high ledge tiled bat roosts on Cliff Island with bats hanging there. According to a book in the library, stated, stated Irene, those roosts were cleaned out long ago. Now the islanders pretend they never heard of them. The... There would, of course, be some specimens remaining, declared Roy, in his professional style. You saw one the other night, but Cuppy wouldn't admit it. They were passing the Countess now, waddling in from her evening rounds, and ahead lay Cliff Island, more ghostly than ever, though Eileen was ready to face its eerie heights with new confidence. Roy pointed out Signal Head, and Irene realized that the old beacon point was quite close to Castle Rock but off at a different angle than the road, which was why she never had noticed it. Then Irene remembered a postcard that she had been saving for last, and she brought it out and said, Here is the old adventure herself, sailing into Middle Harbor. They've pasted her over a photo of the island trying to make it look real ghostly. They showed it, the picture of the adventure to Jerry Lane from her two tall, square-rigging masts and high stern, she identified her as a French ship of the early 1700s, but the young skipper added that it looked like a stock picture from some old book and that it certainly was not a ghostly craft coming into the Cliff Island Channel, which was incorrectly shown in the composite photo. When they finally arrived in Middle Harbor and docked at the float, Jerry ducked down into the cabin and poked his head up again and grinned at Irene. I hear you've been needing company up at the house, and I thought maybe I could help out, he said. With that, he brought 
a brown and white spotted cat into sight and handed it purring to Irene. Her name is Ginger, and she came on board the Port Clarion. Maybe she'll be happier at Castle Rock than sailing in the rover. Irene thanked Jerry profusely and carried the contented cat to Cuppy's cab. That's a tongue twister. Cuppy nosed Ginger, and while they were driving up the cliff, the cliff road he marked. You may be needing that cat at your place. She looks like a good ratter. This cat, returned Irene, still has all her nine lives, which is the same number as a baseball team. So she isn't a, a ratter. She is a batter. I may, I may let her go after some of those bats that are still hanging around their old roosts under the cliff. Let the... Like the one you and I saw in the fog, Mr. Cuppy. That clip silenced Cuppy for the next few days. Everything was peaceful. Then one mild evening, while Irene was doing uh, translations in her study and Roy was playing pinochle with Alan in the living room, a new scare struck. Irene let, had let Ginger out, and as the cat hadn't returned, Irene picked up a long, a long five-cell flashlight and went the back door to look for her new pet. Um, this is not looking good for the cat, but we are going to have to stop that here. Leaving it on a cliffhanger, I know. But, um, anyways, we have been reading from Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. I just lost my page. Oops. Maybe I didn't. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I lost my page, but I didn't. Okay, good. Anyways, um, we've been reading from Rod Serling's Twilight Zone, 26 Unforgettable Explorations into the Realm of the Supernatural, and this book was adapted by Walter P. Gibson. Uh, we've been reading from The Riddle of the Crypt. And um, so, yeah. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe, and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, if you want to join the Discord server, all the information will be in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.